All right, Stephen Pressfield. Welcome back to the show. Hey, it's great to be here, Brad. Thanks for having me. Uh, so we've had you on the podcast before to discuss um, your works of fiction that deal with Greek history, Gates of Fire, uh, the, uh, the Virtues of War, some of my favorite books. But you have a new novel out uh, called The Knowledge, a too close to true novel. And we're going to get into the details of the novel here in a bit because the story is fantastic. It's a bit of autobiographical fiction. There's some crazy stuff that happens in the book. So I want to know if this actually, some of the stuff actually happened to you. Um, But before we get to that, you, I want to talk about what's on the inside of the jacket of the book, because I think it'll give some context about the details of the novel. Um, You say this novel shares the origin tale of the ideas you laid out in your popular book, The War of Art. Um, It's a book popular with entrepreneurs, uh, artists, writers, etc. And the big idea there is this idea of the resistance. Uh, For our listeners who aren't familiar with that concept, can you briefly describe what the resistance is? Well, if you're a writer, Brett, as you are, and as probably a lot of your listeners are, you know that when you sit down to the blank page, you can feel a force radiating off that empty page. And it's a, and it's a, a negative force that's trying to make you go uh, go get a hot fudge sundae or go surfing or do something like that. Anything other than actually face the page. And that is resistance in my, with a capital R. It's this negative force that kicks in anytime we try to do, to move from a lower level to a higher level or to enact any kind of creative instinct. And this isn't just for writers. It can also happen in your life. Whenever you want to have a goal, like you want to lose weight, the resistance is go eat that hot fudge sundae. Exactly. If you've ever brought to home a, uh, the, an ab machine or a treadmill or something and watched you gather dust, then uh, you know what resistance is. Any, it, it seems to kick in, in all seriousness, anytime we try to move from kind of a lower moral, ethical, spiritual level to a higher one, including in relationships, anything like that. But so, yeah, I think everyone's experienced that resistance of, you know, writer's block or procrastination or, you know, you buy the, the membership of the gym, and you just don't go. But are there some more insidious, ex, you know, forms of resistance where you don't think it's resistance, but it really is resistance? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I have a sort of a little motto that I ask myself and uh, or that I apply in cases like that. And the motto is when in doubt, it's resistance. You know, uh, resistance kind of, it comes for me at least as, as a voice in your head, you know, that, that usually is trying to talk you out of doing, uh, the thing that you know that you have to do. And it may say something like, uh, you're worthless. Uh, this is a terrible idea. Why did you even come up with this idea? It's been done a million times. You're never going to be able to finish it. That, that sort of thing. Or resistance will take the form of a just distraction, like I was just saying. It'll come up with any number of other alternatives that you might do. Log on to Facebook, log on to Snapchat, uh, distract yourself with this or that. And in its darker forms, it gets into actual vices and, uh, you know, drugs, alcohol, uh, abuse of oneself or others, that kind of thing. And... Um, to get even darker about it, uh, if you want me to, do you want me to keep going in this, Brett? Um, <laughs> uh, one of the things is that people in our world, people that we're intimate with, sometimes they will embody resistance and lay it on us. For instance, if you decide that you're going to write the novel that you've always wanted to write, and you kind of get yourself together professionally and you start to do it. You're actually sitting down, you get it one week, two weeks, three weeks. What you'll find, dark as this is, is that the people closest to you, not all of them, but some of them, will start trying to sabotage you. And um, if you've ever seen movies by David O. Russell, like The Fighter with Mark Wahlberg or Joy, the recent one uh, starring Jennifer Lawrence, he gets into these dysfunctional families where, you know, the mother, the sisters, the, the, the boyfriend, the wife, the husband will try to, to sabotage the person who is defeating his or her own resistance. So it's this resistance is a really dark force 
that uh, is diabolical in the ways that it can um, get after you. Right. And it, what's interesting too, and I think you talk about this in the the uh, war of art is that, yeah, the, that example of people around you, people who love you, part of, you know, they're your family, your friends, they're going to bring you down when you're trying to improve yourself. They're like, why are you changing? This is not the way it's supposed to be. And then you leave them, you know, kind of get away uh, to do better. But then you find yourself being attracted or drawn to people who are just like your friends and family who are trying to pull you back down like the proverbial crab in the bucket. Yes, it's true because that's now – What's happening, what's the dynamic that's really happening when somebody else tries to bring you down in that kind of case is it's not that they're bad people. It's that they're dealing with their own unconscious resistance. For instance, they may have a dream that they, you know, feel in their heart that they want to do that they're not doing. So when they see you, Brett, when they see you writing your novel or, or uh, doing, you know, creating your startup company or whatever it is, your actions become a reproach to them. Even, and this happens on an unconscious level. They don't even know they're doing it. And so they will say to you things like, uh, what's happening, you Brett, man, you've changed. No, you used to be, we used to be able to get stoned together. We'd have a great time. Now you're going off and uh, what do you, who do you think you are? You're some, you're better than us. That sort of is that is the ways that resistance manifests itself in uh, in mo- in the more insidious ways, other than just a voice in your own head. Right. So uh, you argue that in order to overcome the resistance, you have to become a professional and stop being an amateur. Um, what's the difference between a, a pro and an amateur in your the way you frame it? Um, one of the things is when. When we fall prey to resistance, when we're mired in our own resistance and we just can't get anything done, sometimes we'll, we'll blame ourselves. We'll put a, a value judgment on it. We'll say, well, there's something wrong with me. You know, it's like I'm sick. I have some demented thing from childhood or whatever. Or, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll blame ourselves, in other words. And the idea of Amateur versus pro, of turning pro in a situation like that. It's just, it, it worked for me that thinking of it that way in that it takes the value judgment out of it. You stop telling yourself that there's, you're wrong or you're quote unquote sick or there's something, you know, that's not functioning right with you. Really, the mistake that we make when we get defeated by resistance is we're, we're operating as amateurs. Um, now, what is an amateur as opposed to a pro? An amateur is somebody that, like, uh, is a weekend warrior um, that doesn't really take it seriously enough, whatever their dream is. If you, um, if you want to become uh, a, a piano, professional piano player, right, or a concert pianist, you, what do you have to do? I mean, realistically, you have to commit yourself to hours and hours a day. Of, of working on your music and working on all the aspects of it, the career aspects of it, the health aspects of it, the mental toughness aspects of it, as well as the musical aspects of it. And the, the way that I found it worked for me is just to turn that switch in your mind where you say to yourself, I'm not going to be an amateur anymore. I'm not going to be a weekend warrior. I'm going to, I'm going to turn pro. I'm going to think of myself as a professional and, one of the things about, I know I'm rambling on here, but um, for instance, a pro, what does a pro do that an amateur doesn't do? A pro shows up every day. A pro stays on the job every day. A pro plays hurt. You know, um, I could go on and on, but that's, I think you get the idea of what I'm, what I'm getting at there. Right. Uh, one of the things I found in the, uh, the War of Art that really helped me out is in that idea of trying to think of yourself as a pro is thinking of your profession, whatever it is, if you're a writer, uh, a, a business owner, like think of it as a corporate entity that's not you, right? Because I feel like a lot of writers, entrepreneur types, artists, they tie up their work with their, their self so much. So if they suffer defeat in their that one aspect of their life, they it just demolishes their, their entire self-worth. But when you separate that, you think, okay, this is my work. This is a corp, this is 
this is Steve Inc. over here. If I'm not doing good in Steve Inc., that means I'm not necessarily doing bad in my other areas of life. Yeah, that's that is a you know, when I when I first got out to Hollywood and started working as a screenwriter, um, I learned, and this is in the war of art, uh, that many writers were incorporated and um, they had their little one man corporations. And when they signed a contract to do a script or screenplay, whatever it is, it would be FSO, for services of. So they would be, their corporation um, would sign the deal for the services of them as an, as an individual, as a private person. And I thought that was a great way of uh, separating the entity part of yourself that does the actual work from the entity that is sort of managing you. So you have to sort of, it's a great device to sort of split yourself in half. And the one half of you can kick the ass of the other half of you, you know, and also can encourage you and support you. You know, it, in our world as, as writers or artists or entrepreneurs or whatever it is, we're competing with uh, um, Facebook, we're competing with General Dynamics. We're competing with uh, Frigidaire. We're competing with all these corporations out there. Uh, and we have to be as organized in our own minds, in our, in our own selves, as they are. And we have to have just as uh, something, uh, a, a place like Apple, let's say, under Steve Jobs, has its corporate culture that demands a certain level of work and will not be satisfied uh, below a certain level of excellence, we, you and I as individuals, Brett, and anybody that's listening to this, we have to be Apple in our own heads and have that same sort of corporate culture only on the individual level that has a level of excellence that we aspire to and that we won't let ourselves fall below. And we also, we have to be able to motivate ourselves to reinforce ourselves, to pick ourselves up when we fall down. And um, all of those things are aspects of thinking of yourself as a professional instead of an amateur. For instance, an amateur, when an amateur encounters adversity, an amateur will quit. You know, they'll say, well, I'm just going to go to the movies. I'm going to hang out with my girlfriend, I'm gonna, whatever it is. But a professional, if you think about Michael Jordan or LeBron James or something like that, they wake up in the morning, they've got a high ankle sprain, they've got a, a broken uh, you know, finger on their shooting hand, they play, they show up they because they have that professional attitude. Whereas the amateur might quit and just say, you know, it's just it's too rough today, I can't handle it. The professional will get in the arena and do his or her job. Right. And I think one thing you talk about too is the amateur is, is really tied up. I mean, amateur means that you do it for the love of the whatever, right? You do it for the love of the sport. Um, but love, you know, it's a feeling. Feelings are fleeting. And uh, sometimes you feel like you love it and sometimes you feel like you don't love it. And so I guess that's one of the reasons why uh, an amateur would be more susceptible to the resistance. Yeah, I would even put it in a slightly different way, Brad. It's like, the word amateur comes from the Latin root, you know, amo, amas, amat, meaning that somebody that plays for the love of the game only, right? as opposed to playing for money, let's say. But to me, the amateur doesn't love the game enough because if they loved it enough, they would commit to it full bore the way a professional does. And they would think of it even, you know, if, if you're a writer, even if you're, you don't have an agent, you haven't been published, you're sitting there working on a novel or whatever it is, and realistically, you figure the best I can do is self-publish this on Amazon and, you know, it'll sell 200 copies. Nonetheless, you have to think of yourself as if you are Philip Roth or, or Tony Morrison. You have to operate as a full-bore professional or you'll never get to that level. So, I mean, how do you make the switch? Is it just like a mental switch you flip in your brain? Like, okay, I'm no longer an amateur, I'm a pro? Or does it involve embodied actions, right, to help you, you know, train? Well, you know, it's both, Brett. That's a great question. I mean, uh, it's, but it really is a simple mental switch. Like, to me, it's an analogy with, uh, like, um, 
when somebody recognizes that they're an alcoholic, right? They wake up face down in a gutter at four in the morning for the 20th time, and suddenly they are, they, it dawns on them, oh my God, I've got to come out of denial. I really do have a problem with alcohol. And at that point, if, if the person is going to survive, they make that mental switch in their head and they, they basically turn pro and they say to themselves, I have to, I have a problem. I, I can't handle it by myself. I've got to get help. And then they join AA or they take some sort of step and they change their life. Um, it, in other words, it's both of what you said, Brett. It's, it's that decision that is like flipping a switch. But after that decision happens, then there has to be uh, a total change in the, in the way a person lives their life. And um, I always say that an amateur has amateur habits and a pro has pro habits. And they're completely different one from the other. And uh, it's a great exercise for an individual to sort of ask themselves, you know, how do I, how do I pursue whatever this is, whatever my dream is, to be a photographer, a filmmaker, an actor, or whatever it is? Am I pursuing it with amateur habits, or am I pursuing it with professional habits? And if you're doing it with amateur habits, you got to flip the switch and and pursue it with professional habits. Sorry, let's circle back to the knowledge now, because these these ideas you wrote about in the War of Art, like this, the knowledge is about where you got these ideas from. Um, you know, it's about it's a fiction novel about a struggling writer living in gritty 1970s New York City, uh, who makes money on the side driving cabs and managing a band. Um, and then the writer gets involved with his boss's underworld dealings uh, when he has to start tagging his boss's wife's around New York City. Lots of hijinks uh, ensue. Um, really great book. But you, the book says it's it's the too close to true novel. So this stuff happened to you. I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff that happens in this novel. Uh, exactly how close does it follow this period of your life um, as an artist? Pretty close. <laughs> in the, I mean, if you eliminate uh, the, the murders and stuff like that, that's obviously tarting reality up a little bit. But um, the basic internal story, just like we were talking about a couple of minutes ago, Brad, about the, it's really, when you talk about the struggling writer, this really was me at that era in New York. I'm driving a cab, I'm tending bar, I'm writing a book, I'm doing all kinds of other stuff, writing my third book, actually, all three of them failed, you know, never got published. Basically, what that story is, is a, it's a person that's living the amateur life and allowing distractions and, uh, you know, in the form of sex, drugs, blah, 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 all of the other crazy stuff that we all get into in that sort of time in our life. And the turning point at the end of the book, it could be looked at as the, the protagonist turning pro. And, and, um, so it's as simple as that. Uh, the, the villain of this book, the knowledge, is simply resistance with a capital R, just what we're talking about here. It's not any individual. There's no uh, bad guy that's uh, going against the protagonist. It's all inside his head as he sabotages himself um, in his struggles to be a writer. And finally, what happens, I was talking about, you know, waking up face down in a, in a ditch and saying to yourself, you know, gee, I do have a problem with alcohol. That is the, the sort of the all is lost moment for the hero of this book. The knowledge is he sort of finally totally crashes and burns and says, wakes up and says to himself, I do have a problem. I'm sabotaging myself. There's some demon inside me that's stopping me from, from, you know, just getting out of my own way. And at that point he makes the decision that he's got to change something, you know, because he realizes, you know, the alternative is basically to die. So, um, so this, the, the events of the, of the novel, the knowledge, many of them are true to my true life. And they are the events out of which the ideas of the war of art came and uh, for me. And when I sort of realized that there was this negative force called resistance, 
that it was beating the crap out of me day after day, year after year, and that I had to get a handle on it one way or another, or I was just going absolutely nowhere, and my life was going down the toilet. Right. And in the novel, the the protagonist, um, who's also named Stephen, um, he he encounters people, individuals, friends, coworkers, who it seems like they planted the seeds of this idea that he needs to turn pro or else he's not going to... Um, He's not going to survive. He's not going to thrive. I'm curious, Did when you were in New York City at this time in your life, did you encounter people like that that planted the seeds of these ideas of the resistance and turning pro? Yes, um, definitely. And I think we all have those people in our lives, right? And there may be a, a, a boss or a mentor that is like constantly trying to kick us in the butt and get us to see what we can't see and what we're in denial of. Or maybe we have a friend or a, a, a spouse or uh, girlfriend or boyfriend and where you have those, maybe it, maybe it's in a moment of a terrible fight when they just sort of unload on you and they say, you know, look in the mirror and you know, see what you, that sort of stuff. Right. So yeah, there definitely were characters and people in my life that did, that were really positive influences on me. And some of them are in the book, literally. Uh, and I, I think we all, we all have that in our lives. We do have friends and people who love us, who are trying to uh, make us see what's right in front of our face when we're in denial of it, as I certainly was and a lot of people are. Right. And sometimes your friends just act as an example. I guess in the novel, Stephen has a friend who uh, works in an ad, ad company who's just super disciplined, meditates, gets up early, just does everything by the book, right? He has a routine and he sticks to it. He's, he's a pro. Um, and it seems like now in, in your in your life that, you know, routine ritual is really important to you as, as well. So I imagine there was someone in your life that you encountered that was just like that. Yeah, that's exactly true. And it, it, re- it really is. There are so few people I, I find who actually do possess self-discipline. If you think about, you know, you look through your own life and everything like you do, Brett, that's for sure. And uh, coming up, I had maybe just one friend, really, that, that did that, you know, that would get up with the crack of dawn and, you know, do piano stuff and meditate and do that sort of thing. And, and he, uh, he was a role model to me, and I basically tr- tried to become him and have uh, copied so much of the way I live right now from this one particular friend. Uh, so, yeah, role models are tremendously important. And in a way, I mean, what you're doing with the art of manliness is trying to be a sort of online role model for a lot of people. And I'm trying to do that myself on my on my blog um, because it helps. Nowadays, you, you know, people that get it online rather than um, in person. Let's talk about the title of the book, The Knowledge. Um, it comes from the, the – in the novel, Stephen and his friend Gil work on this concept music album, and they call it The Knowledge. Um, and it's based off of the knowledge, which is what London cabbies have to memorize to become cab drivers. Basically, London cabbies have to like memorize the entire map of London and all the cattywampus you know, streets there and how to get to different places. I mean, it takes two or three years for uh, someone to memorize this stuff. Um, but you know, for Stephen and Gill in novel in the novel, the knowledge seemed to represent something higher. So, what did the knowledge represent for Stephen and Gill? Um, that's a great question, Brett. Um, and you're right. The knowledge in terms of London taxi drivers is sometimes it's referred to as the hardest test in the world. And these guys who want to be London cab drivers, there's like 20,000 different lanes and streets in London. And they will literally get on a bicycle or a moped or something. And for two years, you know, with a pad and a pencil, they'll ride around London just trying to memorize where all the streets go. And they have to pass, you know, a test where somebody will say, you know, how do you get from Earl's Court to Shepherd's Bush? You know, and, and uh, you know, you got to play that back. So... I asked myself as writing this, writing this book, what's the metaphor here? And the metaphor is just as a cabbie has to learn the geographic layout of, of the city of London, what you and I as writers or artists or entrepreneurs or just as human beings, 
we have to we have to learn the knowledge, quote unquote, of life, of the city, the city of, of life. And we have to learn how to navigate from A to B and all that sort of stuff. But in 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 the, the concept that uh, that I was applying it in the book, it was not only knowledge of um, the real material world, but knowledge of our interior world. And when we're talking like we were before, Brad, about resistance and about self sabotage, that sort of stuff, we have to learn. The, the knowledge of the, our inner city, our inner London that's inside us, how to navigate around our own self-imposed roadblocks. And beyond that, I would even go to say that it was knowledge of previous lives or other um, things from dimensions that are beyond the material dimension or even the interior dimension. So it's sort of like we come out of the womb, we're in this strange place called planet Earth, where we have uh, an unconscious and we have a conscious and we have the, the world out there in front of us. And from infancy, we're trying to master it. Like, where are we? Who are we? Why are we here? What are we trying to do? And how can we do it? What is it all about? These are the questions that everybody asks themselves. And that, in terms of the book, that's what quote unquote, the knowledge means. But why do you think uh, sometimes seeking the knowledge, right? It ends up swallowing people, you know, mentally, emotionally, and sometimes physically. Um, you know, they, they just, they do themselves harm trying to seek out the knowledge. And why do you think that happens to people? Well, you know, it's, it's a big world and it's a dangerous world and it's full of a lot of, uh, negative and evil stuff. And I'm talking about inside our own heads. We don't have to look for bad people out there who will, who will harm us. So it, you it really, when we sort of, you know, most people live life on a very shallow level, right? They don't, uh, if they have a job, if they have a spouse, if they can raise a family, they're happy with that. Right. Um, but when, any of us try to, to uh, go deep, we're playing with fire because um, there are a lot of uh, blind alleys out there and alleys that will take you down, uh, you know, down sinkholes. Um, and uh, that's why I think um, mentors are so important and finding somebody that uh, just like, this is a bad analogy, Brett, but like, you know, when a young quarterback comes into the NFL, let's say, they the coach will not throw him into a game too soon, right? Sometimes a quarterback, even Aaron Rodgers, was played behind Brett Favre for years, right? And there have been many um, players that are thrown into the deep end too soon, and it can ruin you. That's just the way life is, you know? So um, it, that's why mentors and coaches and role models are so important that can sort of uh, lead the young person, you know, like Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker, can lead the person one step at a time and not expose them to too much too soon because uh, it's a dangerous world out there and inside our own heads. And that was what the character, actually his name was Peter, um, in the book. Um, and um, that was what, what that, why that character was in the book, to represent the dangers of um, pursuing art too deeply or pursuing the knowledge too deeply when you're not prepared um, and don't have the... Um, the mental discipline and the, and the mental self knowledge. Yeah, and I think it was, that ties in nicely with one of the other things that you talk about in the War of Art about being pro. We talked about this a bit already, but being detached. You have to keep a little detachment from your work and even from the task of seeking that higher thing you're looking for as well, or else it will it will end up doing a lot of damage. I think that's true. It's a it's a great point, but it's like um, one of the things I one of the attributes of a professional, I think is that they don't they take they don't take success or failure personally 
they, again, they can sort of split themselves in half and say, okay, I had a great success, but I'm not going to let it get my head swelled. Or, okay, I crashed and burned, but that doesn't mean that I'm a loser. I just had, I just made one, I, you know, I did something wrong. I'll correct it. And um, I think it's great to have that sort of witness perspective as well as the, the man in the arena perspective as we're navigating life. And, and it's a mistake, I think, to take things too personally, to be so totally, um, in, you know, engaged in something that when it, it, an endeavor fails, it's like we have failed as, as human beings and as souls, which is not the case at all. It's just an endeavor that's failed. We'll dust ourselves off. We'll get up again. We'll try again. Right. So in, in the novel, uh, the protagonist, he's in his late 20s, thereabouts. Um, and the book ends with him leaving for California in a van with his beloved cat. And you actually had a cat, right, at this time period in your life? Yeah. yeah. I, I love how you love the cat. Um, so he has this sort of, he has the knowledge about overcoming the resistance. So I'm curious, what happens to this protagonist when he gets to sunny L.A.? Does he experience wild, immediate success, or does it take time even after you acquire the knowledge of the resistance and turning pro? That's, that's another great question, Brett. And, um, well, I'll tell you the real, the, what really happened was that uh, after I, I, I left New York, in my late twenties, having given up on writing novels, I just figured I just can't do it. It's beyond me. Um, I'll I'll be like Peter. I want to kill myself if I keep doing this. And so I said, I'm going to reinvent myself. I'm going to go to L.A. I'm going to be I'm going to try to be a screenwriter. And uh, so at that point, I I had sort of flipped the switch to being a professional. But the bottom line was, it took me like another six or seven years before I made the first penny. So there was plenty of struggle and plenty of um, lessons learned and, and uh, you know, almost like getting a PhD in a field that you don't, you know, that doesn't have an actual college. Um, so uh, yeah, it took, uh, in the real world, it took a long time. And I, I would think even if you would imagine what would happen to that fictional character in the knowledge that, probably the same thing would happen to him. It's not, success is not just going to come immediately to him, but um, at least he's turned the corner and is operating as a professional now and not as an amateur, even though he isn't making any money yet. Right. When did you, when did, at what point in your life did you start trying to write a novel again? Ah, another great question. It wasn't for, let me see. The novel was The Legend of Bagger Vance and it, it was in, it was like another 15 years after I uh, left New York and went to L.A. Why do you think it took that long? You were just focused on your, I mean, do you think there was like some resistance going on there? Like you were using screenwriting, like that was the resistance to writing the novel, you think? I was so traumatized by, I worked for like maybe 13 years trying to write novels, you know, you know supporting myself doing these crazy jobs, and they all failed. So I was just totally traumatized by that. And I pretty much had made up my mind I was never going to try it again. So, um, but the, working in the movies was uh, a real college education, PhD, and learning about the principles of storytelling and learning about how to, how to conduct yourself as a professional and how to manage your emotions. And I think at some point that, that seed that had been planted 15 years earlier that I had put away 15 years earlier, it just sort of stayed dormant through that time. And then it just kind of popped up and, um, it, it popped up when I had the idea for the legend of Bagger Vance. it kind of just popped into my mind, fully formed and as a book, not as, as a movie. So I sort of knew, okay, I've got, to, I've got to switch. I've got to go uh, back into this arena that I had failed in so miserably. Um, but oddly enough, it was a piece of cake. And the book came out, came out of me fast and got bought fast and got made into a movie fast. Right. That's, that's the muses. 
uh, in action there, right? Yeah, I guess so. It's the it's the unconscious. It's the it's the goddess, you know, inspiring us. It's things we can't explain. You know, we're trying to find the knowledge of that, but uh, it's beyond us. So, Stephen, do you still struggle with the resistance today, even though you you have this pro mentality? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, it never goes away. Um, it's just as, uh, you know, I always say it's, it's, you have to slay the dragon again every morning. Never goes away. never gets any easier. The only thing, I'm sure you know this yourself, Brett, from, you know, all the work that you do is you've had enough success. You've faced it down enough times that you know you can do it now, which is different from when you were first starting out. You didn't know if you could defeat it at all. But now at least you know, you know, I've done it. 10,000 times. So I guess I can do it again today, but it's always there and it's always ready to kill you. And it will kill you if you let it. Well, Stephen, this has uh, been a great conversation and there's a lot more we could talk about, but where can more, where can people learn more about the knowledge and uh, the rest of your work? Um, I, everything is on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Um, but I also have a, uh, a blog that's just my name, www.stephenpressfield.com. And uh, everything is there. And I do a, a, every Wednesday, I do a post called Writing Wednesdays. And it's sort of like an ongoing chapter in the war of art. And it's about the craft and it's about professionalism and it's about, you know, overcoming the uh, demons of self sabotage with it within us. So let me thank you, Brett. Thanks for having me on the podcast here. And thanks for the great questions. It's uh, it's always fun to to uh, you know get into this uh, studio with you. Well, thanks so much, Stephen Pressfield. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. My guest today was Stephen Pressfield. His latest book is called The Knowledge. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find more information about Stephen's work at stephenpressfield.com. Also, check out our show notes for this episode at aom.is/slash/the-knowledge, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.